When we met last week, we discussed Tutorial 1. There was one portion of Tutorial 1 that we did not get to, which was the image tag. Um, when I say we didn't get to it, I did tell you how to put it in for the, the homework, but we didn't get to discuss it as length, at length like we did with the other aspects of Tutorial 1. So in this video, I'm just going to be wrapping up Tutorial 1 by going over the image tag. I don't usually like to teach by slide, but since I can't write on the board and, and we're just dealing with four slides here, it'll give us something visual to look at as we're discussing the concepts. So, let's go ahead and get started. The first thing I want to point out are the various file formats up here that we could be looking at when we're adding images to a web page. GIF stands for Graf Graphics Interchange Format. JPEG stands for Joint Photographic Experts Group. JPEG is also commonly abbreviated as JPG instead of JPEG. And PNG. PNG stands for Portable Networks Graphics. These will, um, well, the, the GIF and the JPEG will be used the most frequently. PNG is less common, and another file format that is even uh, more infrequent is BMP for bitmap. That is, these are all bitmap files. The GIF, the JPEG, and the PNG are all uh, bitmap files, but, um, but the BMP is not compressed, so it's a very large file, and that's why we tend not to use that because we don't want visitors to have to be downloading for an excessive period of time, especially if they're using a mobile device. Moving on, the next thing we see is the tag for our image down here. Uh, last week we discussed the wicket, which was our... Um, less than and greater than sign, what we commonly think about is that we call a wicket. We talked about the closing switch and the tag being the wicket as well as its element inside, this whole um, area being called a, a tag. IMG, the image element, is one of those few times that we alluded to where a tag opens and closes within the same tag rather than having a separate closing tag. We also have another term to learn, uh, which is that we can have an attribute. An attribute is when we modify an element. So in this case, we're going to modify the IMG element with an attribute that contains a value, and in this case, the name and location of our file. Let me go ahead and minimize this. And what you'll see now on my desktop is simply the file that we worked with last week. I'm going to go ahead and zoom in on this. Uh, but this is just downloaded directly from Blackboard, the sample that we created last week. And I'm going to go ahead and insert our image here. I've obtained this image from the textbook file, this uh, logo. And I'm going to go ahead and add it into the document. I'm going to do this right here, pretty high up in the document, so that we can easily see the code. So we know that this was our tag, and I have to add in an, an attribute to modify this. The SRC designates our source, and now I need to get the file name. Let me go ahead and put my second set of quotes there so I don't forget, but in here I'm going to need to add the file name. An easy way to determine the full name of our file is just to right click and go to properties. If we do this we see that this is worldmusiclogo.jpg. I'm going to go ahead and save, and I'm going to refresh this page, and we'll see that my logo appears. Let's go ahead and go back to the PowerPoint file, and I'm going to flip to the next slide. 
and we'll see some additional attributes. Instead of just the SRC, we also have an alternative tag as well as width and height for the image. I'm going to go ahead and add that alternative tag into my existing, or sorry, the alternative text into my existing tag. So that's just ALT equals. I'm going to write world music logo. Alternative text can be very useful for two main reasons. One is, let's say that somebody was using a screen reader and they could not actually see this image. They would be able to read the alternative text or have it read to them uh, and they would have an indication of what was on the page. Another reason for the alternative text is if for some reason the image doesn't load, the alternative text would give the visitor an idea of what it was that they are missing. So that we can see what would happen if the image doesn't load, I'm going to misname this file. I'm just going to add a one after it. And we know that this is not the file name, so this tag is not going to work properly. I'm going to go ahead and save this and refresh, and we will see that the image does not appear, but the alternative text, World Music Logo, does appear. Now we also see that this is taking up a much smaller space. This is where the height and width attribute could come in handy. Let's go ahead and take a look at this. So I can define the height and width of my image in pixels in the tag, in my IMG tag, I could specify the height and width of the image. So at this point we might be wondering what is the height and width of our image and why would we want to specify it. Let me go ahead and minimize this. Now notice when I give this the proper name, heading 2 starts down here. In fact I only see through this Heading 3, which now that I look at this last week, I had actually, I had meant to change these designations so that the tag actually reflected the heading. So I'll go ahead and do that. Oops, let me save and refresh. Um, so I only saw to heading 4 when the image was there. If I change this, again, I'm giving it the wrong file name so that we intentionally do not see the image. Notice I can see much more of the page. If I had a more complicated layout and the image did not load, I could have a dramatic shift in the way that the rest of the page appears. Or what if initially the image didn't load, it looked like this, and then it slowly began to load. The layout would be shifting. That would be one reason for me to specify the height and width. So you might be asking yourself, what is the actual height and width that I should use? Or do I just make something up? Well, we don't actually make something up because we would potentially be distorting the proportions of the image. Now let me go ahead and go back to that Properties window. Just right-click on our file and go to Properties. And I believe it's under Details we can see the height and width of the image. It is 500 pixels in width by 375 pixels in height. So I'm going to go ahead and close this. I'm going to add those height and width attributes. And now when I refresh the page, at least, even though I can't see the image yet because I'm still using the wrong file name, I'm seeing the image in the proper proportions and it's allowing the rest of my page to maintain the same layout as it would otherwise. Let me go back to the proper file name. I'm also going to open this just in a photo viewer so we can, let me go ahead and minimize that a little bit, so we can sort of see the image down here to the side and I'm going to change the height and width 
more dramatically. Let's say that I decided that this image was too small, too tall, and I changed this to 175 instead of 375. This is something that we should not do. I'm only showing you this to illustrate why. So I'm going to go ahead and save this and refresh. And if you look at the original image, it is clear that the proportions have been distorted. The image no longer retains the same ratio between height and width because I've short decreased the height and kept the width consistent. Now we'd have to do quite a lot of math to figure out how we would decrease this proportionally. For instance, it was originally 375. Let's say, and I'll go ahead and refresh so you can see that it comes back to its regular proportions. Let's say that I wanted to uh, reduce this a little bit. One thing I could do is take 100 off of both sides. I'm making this 2 and 400. And then I still maintain the right proportions. The image is not uh, distorted from doing this. Or I could change just the height and not the width. Let me change this to 100. And you'll see that again I don't distort the image because I've only changed one proportion. So the other one maintains the same proportion, the width that I've left unspecified. This is still a bad idea to do this though because this image takes up a certain amount of file space to display in the, in the proper resolution. And if we're going to decrease the size, we really should have decreased the size of our file as well and actually uploaded a smaller image. Similarly, if we are going to increase the size, let me change this beyond its height to something like 500. Remember, it was 375 originally. It tends to decrease in quality. The edges start to get a little bit less crisp. If I increase it further, this is more emphasized. I did all of this to illustrate that we really should not be modifying the height and width of an image through these attributes. We want to use the height and width attributes. If we're going to use them, we want to use them to display the actual proportions of the image. If we need to shrink the image or expand the image, we should be using photo editing software to do that. And that is actually something that we're going to be talking about pretty soon. So we can go ahead and just put that on hold and know that for now, when I specify my height and width, I should be using the actual height and width of the image. Let's go back to our slideshow and see what other attributes we have. We also have the attribute of the title tag. I'm going to go ahead and add the title tag to my page. Notice right now when I hover, nothing has appeared. Now when I hover, I see the text title tag example. This is actually one of those things that's unique to Internet Explorer. In many other browsers, the text, the alternative text would have actually been our tool tip or what appears when hovered. Uh, but that gives you an idea of the title tag and alternative text. In this case, they probably should have been the same, but since this is just a sample web page, I'm going to leave it how it appears now. Let me go back to the slides because there's one last thing that we needed to wrap up as far as our image discussion. And this is the fact that ideally we should be placing images in an images folder as is indicated on this slide. So ideally we should actually create a folder and I'm going to do this on my desktop called images 
and we should be placing the image in that folder. Of course, when I refresh, now I'm not going to be able to see my image. That's because it's in this images folder. And when I say in my IMG tag that the source is worldmusiclogo.jpg, it is looking in the same location as this HTML file. Here's the HTML file on my desktop. It is looking on my desktop for the image file, but the image file is not directly on my desktop now. It is in a folder called images. So in order for this image to display, I now have to add images to the path. So I named the folder name slash and then my file name. I'm going to go ahead and save and refresh this and we'll see that it appears. It is good practice in the long run to create an images folder and start saving images in the images folder. It makes things a little bit easier for us in terms of file management later on when we're working with a website that has a number of HTML files and a number of images. The last thing we need to do here is validate our file. And when we do this, we are actually going to see that we have an error. I go to direct input, go ahead and select my text, and paste this in. Oh, that's interesting. It was my understanding that the image tag needed to be within its own paragraph tag. I'm going to have to look that up to find out why that didn't come in as an error. It definitely would have an XHTML 1.0. We should put our image tag within its own paragraph tag. So let me go ahead and validate this with the, excuse me, uh, with the paragraph tag around our image tag. Oops. Back. Sorry about that. Great. I paused the video for a minute and I went ahead and renamed my file sample1image.html just to create some differentiation between last week. If you go on to our class um, Blackboard site under class discussions, you will see the image files. Now the book also does a little demonstration where they use a uh, World Music Logo file that's smaller, just to show you examples with the height and width. Uh, but I've gone ahead and included those here. Also down at the bottom, you'll see the sample page that we were working on in this video. So I'm going to go ahead and close up this video, uh, put it on YouTube, add it to the class discussions page underneath this, and then we will resume with a new video to prepare for our quiz next week.